And we're going to be focusing just on the back of the cloak and the little pointy hood hanging down there. And also these two little, uh, the cow, I think it's a cowl. I don't know what the little, what's the little cape called? Um, the two little shoulder panel thing. We'll just base coat those and work on those today. <clears throat> if you're using Nightmare Black, it is a bit of a uh, translucent color. So if you, if you prime your model black, you won't have to worry too much about it. But if you prime your model white, then you probably need to do an extra coat. Um, but for the purposes of learning today, we're just going to do two and then uh, get to that. And again, like you don't have to use Nightmare Black. I had a few people asking me if you could use something different and you definitely can. Um, I recommend going with something that's nearly black on like the purple or the blue side of things, you know, like a, a something that like a night sky color. So uh, someone mentioned deep twilight earlier, which uh, w that'll work for you. Um, the original one that I did was coal black, but I couldn't use that for a class color because I wanted something that would be available to everybody. But yeah, nightmare black is, it's a beautiful color. Blue liner should work. The only reason that I, I'm not sure about that is because just the um, the consistency of the paint. I, I'm not sure if there's a difference in like the texture of the liners versus the uh, just the regular MSP paints, but it should be okay. All right, so we'll get that first base coat down and then set that aside to dry for a minute. Does anyone have any initial questions? One is, is confirming that you're base coating with Nightmare Black. That's correct. Yeah, base coat with Nightmare Black. And it, the I'll repeat the ratio that I did for it is I did four drops of paint to one drop of water and I doubled that. So eight drops of paint, two drops of water gives it nice, uh, a nice thin mix there. Yeah, the hobby holder is great. I, I love the arm. Um, the arm on it, it's definitely, uh, something that's hard, not it's hard when you don't have it after you've used it before. Uh, okay. So let's, can I do you, is it okay forward a little bit? Yeah, it is new. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do while we wait for that to dry is get the rest of our paints laid out. Um, the clears that we have today are the blue, purple, and magenta. Uh, I picked those because they blend a little bit easier than some of the other ones. But like I mentioned earlier, if you missed when we were talking before we started here, galaxies and starscapes, if you look online and Google just like galaxy photo or, or galaxy picture, there it's every color you can imagine. Like I've seen some awesome green and orange ones, some that have deep reds. Um, so definitely try different things out there too, once you have like a handle on how the technique works. Um, but we're going to lay out also four to one with these. Because they're clear, they're already pretty translucent. So you don't need to worry about going too thin. And actually, the thickness of the paint is going to work in our favor a bit later. So you don't want it to be super runny, but you also don't want to have, have you don't want it to, to be a texture. You don't want it so thick that it's going to uh, add a texture to your model later. I would do a quick repeat of what you did on the back of his cloak again, because I think we're getting a couple of people coming in just a few minutes late. Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so the base coat that I put down is Nightmare Black. And I did thin it a bit. I did uh, four to one. I don't know why my camera doesn't like to focus for me. There you go, that's a little better. So I had four to one paint to water. Um, corporeal shadow will work, coal black will work. I wouldn't use black green for this. Uh, I would stick to something more on the blue or the purple side of things for the first time. 
<clears throat> yeah, so the clears that I'm using are blue, purple, and magenta. They actually all come together in a triad, which is really nice. Okay, so again, what we're gonna do with the clears is we're gonna go four to one, paint to water, and I doubled that, so eight to two for each of them. You could go ahead and mix those together. Well, not mix together, but you can thin them out. <clears throat> um, and then the last is the white. So we want to lay our white as well. And let's just, we'll just stick with the same mix for the white too. We'll go four to one. Got a couple of questions. And white. Yeah, so the, you can use pure white. Um, Dragon white, I, I think dragon white is pretty close to a pure white. Um, so yeah, you can use that. The benefit of the clear paint. Um, it's not necessarily, I'm definitely not a, a paint expert, but in my experience, it's not necessarily that they're thinned, it's that the pigments in them are trans, not transparent, they're translucent. So when you thin them down, they you can use them as a filter you know, to add uh, saturation to other colors and things. Um, whereas like something like this dragon white here, the pigment's very opaque. Um, so even if you thin it down, when you put it over top of something else, it's gonna cover it a lot more. Uh, yeah, this is a vortex mixer. It's just to uh, save my arm from shaking every bottle of paint that I use. Okay, let's see. Okay, we've got our colors laid out and now we should be, I don't know if everybody's kind of close to having their first base coat dried. I know it varies by what region you're in and the temperature, um, but it should be pretty close to being dry. Um, I'm gonna let mine go for another second and move on to this part. So in the, uh, in the class notes, I mentioned about a stippling brush or an old brush, and it's gonna be pretty important to this. Uh, so I've never tried it without one. Definitely welcome to try it, um, but I, here's what I recommend. Go ahead. Are you thinning the clears four to one as well? Four to one, yeah, I'm just doing four to one for everything, just to keep things simple for today. Uh, if they're a little thick, it doesn't matter. It's actually probably better for them to be a little bit on the thick side than on the thin side. So this is the stippling brush that I usually use. Uh, I bought this from, I think, Michael's for like, I think it was like a $1.10. Uh, it's made by uh, Royal and Langnickel. It's, I think it's an eighth inch, three millimeter stippling brush. Um, and it's got little stiff bristles, but they're still kind of soft, hard to explain. Um, that works, but if you don't have a stippling brush, you could take an old, like this is just an old craft brush that I use probably for terrain or something like that at some point. And I'm going to go about, about an eighth of an inch up. So about that far up on it and I'm just gonna cut the bristles and the thing that I noticed after doing the last one is that it works a little bit better if you make the tip convex rather than concave so I'll show it whenever I after I do it here so you want the bristles that are in the middle to stick out just a little bit farther than the bristles that are on the end. Hold it up here so that you can see it. So you can see the bristles in the middle. I'm actually gonna trim the, the really long ones down there a little bit more, but the bristles around the outside are just a little bit shorter than the bristles in the middle. And that's what you want because when you start to stipple, if it's the other way around, your outside bristles are going to start to hit the model before 
the ones in the middle and it, it's just going to be a lot harder to get the paint to go where you want it to go. So they're pretty similar in the end. You can see there. Yeah. So uh, it's a little secret thing there. I wouldn't use a, a natural hairbrush. I mean, maybe you, not that I wouldn't, but I never have. Um, I just use an old brush because it works perfectly fine. What size was the brush that you just cut? Uh, the one that I cut was a four from Artist's Loft, just a, a round. Um, if I had to compare it to something like a, a Rosemary and Company, yeah, I'd say it's, it's probably a four pretty universally. Series D. Yeah, those are the those are the dry brushes, huh? Yeah, that they probably have a couple of them that are like that too. But the thing is, when you cut a down like this, the bristles feel stiffer, you know, because they have less room to to move around, and that's what we're looking for. We want pliability, but a little bit of stiffness so that they hold their shape. And you'll see why later. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put my second base coat down here and that should be good enough coverage so that we can move on to the next part and that's where all the fun stuff's going to begin <clears throat> so is everybody having a good time at reaper con this year I sat in on some classes and it's pretty crazy you can do remotely rather than being there. I was sad to uh, not be able to go away and see everybody in person, but this was really good. I'm glad that we got to do something. Okay. So let's let that dry. And then while that's drying, what we can do is move on to planning out the direction of our nebulas. If you've looked at the class notes, uh, the class notes are in my Discord page and also posted above. So if you scroll up in the chat, um, you can download the class notes. Uh, the next step that we're going to do direction that we want the nebula to go. So on this cloak, it's a little bit longer in the bottom left. So the way that I did it before is to go from the bottom left to the top right. So down here where the cloak comes to a point and then working up and to the right. So kind of diagonal along there. And it doesn't have to be a perfectly straight line, but you wanna have like, an idea of the direction that you're going to go. And you definitely want your base coat to be dry before you start the next part. So uh, I'm just going to take a minute and plug myself if that's okay. Um, I don't, I don't really do anything professionally, but I, I did it under Hulk's workshop. So I have links and stuff in my class notes. If you're interested in the stuff that I do, I appreciate the follows. If not, that's okay too. Um, but I, I really, I'm blown away by how many people are in this room right now. It's pretty insane to me. Uh, and I, I really, really appreciate everybody being interested. And again, I hope I can live up to the, live up to the hype. Oh, the chat only scrolls up. Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much for reposting those. Okay, so let's see. Anybody have questions? First Reaper come before go. Yeah, it, it has been great. Oh, and there is something else that I just wanted to say while everybody's listening to me, <laughs> is that the first time I went to ReaperCon was in 2018 and I had just started painting like a few months before that and everybody said go 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 and I did and it was amazing but I didn't think that I was very, very good at what I was doing you know I had just started and seeing everybody's work 
that's been painting for a while can be really intimidating. And, you know, walking through the, um, the MSP open room and just seeing everything and being like, how will I ever get here? Um, and getting a little bit of, you know, uh, getting some communication from other people and some reassurance that like, I'm not, I might have just started, but you know, everybody starts somewhere. It was really important to me. Um, and so make sure if you have some time, go through the, um, the, the showcase section on the discord and show some love to people because it's really important that we like, you know, prop each other up. Uh, I hear people say that, that like when we lift each other up, we lift the entire community up and it's totally true. So make sure you go in there and show people that you see what they're doing and that you appreciate it. It's, it's definitely a good thing to do. Yeah. The, Lauren, thank you. The handout is basically exactly what we're going to be doing today. Day. I feel like you missed the step or that we're moving, even though we're not moving quickly, we're going to start moving more quickly once we have the base coat dried. So if you start to feel behind or, you know, like you, like you're never going to be able to finish it in time, that's totally fine. Uh, the, everything's in the class notes and I'll be around um, all for the rest of the, the weekend. And, you know, you can contact me on my pages too, if you have more questions. So don't feel any pressure. That's the last thing I want to do is make people feel pressure about this because it's fun, you know. Uh, David asked in Q&A, what is the, what was the initial inspiration to paint a galaxy on a mini? Um, I don't really know. Actually, I know where I first had the idea was that I was doing a challenge for, um, Josh at mini painting studio did like a color challenge where the only, the goal was just to paint a miniature using color. Like none of the rest of it mattered, none of the technical things. And I painted the Sophie that I posted. And originally, I don't know if anybody saw the photos um, before I had her finished, I originally had like a fire pattern on her wings, almost like on a hot rod car. And it gave a very different vibe. And whenever I started to do them, I was like, I don't know if I like this. And then I thought, I think maybe I could do a sky, like a night sky. And so I just painted right over top. I put, you know, the, the sky black cover the flames and just went for it. I looked up some photos online of galaxies and I was like, I think, and I just went for it. And this is the, uh, this is the the way that I did it, and it was not it was not difficult. Um, it was simple enough that I was like, I should show people how to do this because it's good to share. Oh, uh, Eric, that's all right. Yeah, the class notes are on there. Make sure you save them. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, so let's see. We're still a little bit. A little bit damp there. How's everybody else looking? Are your base coats dry? Are they getting there? I don't want to move on before uh, everybody's ready. The class count? I don't want to say. <laughs> I don't even really want to look again, honestly. It just makes me feel nervous. You guys are dry? Okay. Almost. All right. We're going to wait a minute just so that, because mine's almost there too. All right, so I'll talk about the next step here. So the thing we're gonna do next is the line that we chose for our galaxy. We're gonna add some interest with the clears first. Now, I don't necessarily know if this step is, I don't know if you have to do it, but I know that it's a good idea for me because it's the way that I've done it before. And I didn't wanna do something in the class that I didn't do before being unsure of the way that it's going to turn out because when this is dry, you're not really going to notice it very much, but I feel like there's something about it that I feel like is going to make a difference. So what I just load up your brush. All you really have to do is just like touch your brush to it and you'll get some paint like that. And you don't want that much paint. So I'll show just 
that's that's a lot of paint on there. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove some of that almost like a dry brush. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Use the stippling brush. The, the brush that you cut, use the stippling brush. Um, and once you have the brush loaded, we're just going to take some of that paint off on a towel. I use a cloth towel. I use the paper towel for the first few, but I started to notice that using a paper towel Sometimes with the stippling brush, when it gets damp, it starts to fall apart and you can pick up pieces of the paper towel with the stippling brush. And when you're putting it on the model, you're transferring little pieces of paper towel to the model. Um, so if you're using a paper towel, that's fine. Just keep an eye out for that while you're going because I don't want your, uh, I don't want to not mention it. And then at the end, a bunch of paper towel in your model and I had, didn't say anything. So once you have Somebody your, asked if it matters which clear they start with. No, I usually start with the blue, but it, I don't. It, at this point, it doesn't matter. We're just going to be making a little bit of a color scape underneath everything. So I don't know if you can see. I'm trying to get it in focus here so they can see it. Oh, close. There we go. So you, you just want the brushes to be colored pretty much. You don't want like the big you know, bead of paint in there. And then what I'm gonna do is start from the that we plotted and I'm gonna go and just stipple a bit in that direction from the bottom left to the top right. And you'll barely see this. When it's wet, you'll be able to see the difference. Um, you know, because the wet paint will be more reflective, but once it dries, it's basically going to disappear. So you can do it a couple times, just building some color. You don't have to be super neat. Uh, the line doesn't have to be thin. You know, it can be varied. You can go thinner here and then leave a little space and then a little thicker because what we're doing is basically setting up nebula clouds. And then you can actually do all of the colors while they're wet. You don't need to wait till they're dry. It's almost like a, uh, a wet blend with a stippling. So you don't have to worry and you definitely want to leave some of the color on there. Like it's probably going to be a little bit hard to see the color on camera. I know you can see the difference between the wet paint and the dry paint, but just go ahead and stipple some on there. This is mostly gonna be covered up. So don't worry too much about that. And you can use all three colors, the clear purple, clear magenta, clear blue. Just lay out a nice idea of where the color is gonna go. And then once you have all the colors laid out, you'll notice that the upper left portion and the bottom right portion of the cloak really have any interesting things on there now. It's kind of just a bare, a bare blue landscape. So you can add a little bit of color. It doesn't have to be in any direction, but maybe just put a little bit of paint here, maybe just some down on the bottom over there. Much about controlling exactly where things are going to go yet. You just want to make a little bit of variation with the color. Yeah, you can see the tint in the light for sure. That's that's kind of what my thought was, was that it helps to get some variation, some subtle variation before we move on to the, uh, the really bright variation that we'll get when we add the white. So pulling up the base coat. Yeah, that's that that will happen sometimes. I actually think that maybe it's happening on mine. But we're gonna be adding, Lauren, we're gonna be adding white over top of it. So um, if it did pull up some of your base coat, it should be fine. We should we should be able to cover that up. In, in, uh, in Q&A, somebody asked, uh, would you or could you do this over a cloak if you had done layering and highlights first? Would it affect that work? Uh, would the, I would the about, effect work as well? I, I thought about mentioning that because I think that you could. We're going to do a little bit of shading in the end just to darken down the recesses, but you should try it. I mean, that's what I would say is try it. I would definitely shade, or I'm sorry, I would highlight before you do the galaxy. Um, it would just save you so much trouble than trying to 
do it afterwards. But doing the galaxy is naturally going to highlight some of the folds of the cloak, just because when you're stippling, your brush is going to hit more of the raised areas than the recesses. So you will get a bit of a shade, but yeah, I, I think that you're, I think you're onto something there and you should try it because you can even see on the one that I did as a demo for the uh, class handout, there are, it does look a little bit flat in some of the, um, my stupid phone zoom. It does look a little bit flat in some of the non galaxy areas. So maybe try it out. And I, I'd love to see it. If you do it, share, share the photos with me because I'd love to see it. Okay. So those are just about dry. Yeah, you're in, you can see it a little bit, the color variation there. Somebody asked also, when you're planning the line that you follow, is it necessary to start at the bottom and go to the top or is that part up to the painter? Yeah, it's up to you. You can do, you can do it whichever you like. Um, you don't even really need to do a straight line. Um, it's just for, for that was something that we could all do together. Um, like I said, check, re check reference photos. If you look at reference photos of nebulas, um, they, they're all shapes, all sizes. So I would say the, the best thing to do is grab a reference, reference image and try to use this technique to recreate that reference image. And there, there's so many different things you can do. But no, you don't need to go in any particular uh, direction. Yeah, try blotting off less of the paint. Yeah, you don't want your... You don't want the brush to be like a dry brush. You still want it to be wet. You just don't want it to be overloaded so that it floods your model. Um, the, the first time I did the demo of this to prepare to see how long it would take, I her in my paint and it was just flooding the recesses every time I touched the brush to the model. So yeah, you don't want that. You want it to be a little bit more thick. Um, you, want to, you want it to stay where you put it. Okay. Someone also asked in Q&A if you can use a dry brush, and I think they mean like an actual like brush they use for dry brushing as a stippling right. brush. Yeah, I, I think that you could try that too. I, I think that it would work for this part, but I, I'm not sure if it would work for the part later when we add the stars. Um, I would say try it. I did not experiment with the dry brush. Um, you, you could definitely try though. I think that the shorter the bristles, the better because you want them to be sort of stiff. So you get that uh, sort of splotchy, um, like almost mini starburst effect when you, when you uh, stipple the paint on there. Just getting small blobs of paint. Tom, I would say try to take a little bit more of the paint off, but that's okay if you're getting small blobs of paint because when we add the, the next step, um, it's, gonna, it's gonna cover a lot of that up and then we'll blend the colors in. So if everybody's ready so that we keep things moving a little bit here. So the next thing that we're going to do is take some of the white and we're going to do the same thing, but you have to make sure that you are not going overboard with this. If you do on accident, it's okay. Everything's fixable. And sometimes accidents make, uh, make things look better in the end. So I'm just going to do the same thing that I did and stipple some white in a line. And I'm going to go thin in some places and then some places I'm going to go thick and it's going to look bad. <laughs> like your edges are going to be uh, harsh and it's blended and that's fine. That's the way that uh, that's the way that it's supposed to. So if you think, Oh no, I put on too much white. Don't worry about it. We'll fix it. Someone said that the clear seems to foam up when they stipple. The foam? I haven't had that happen. Um, I think maybe too much water. It could be. Or is it going away after time or is it staying like that and leaving like a dried foam pattern on your model? And while we wait for that answer, oh, it says it dries. Okay, so uh, it defoams. Okay, yeah, so that's okay then. I think, I think you're right. I think there's probably just a little bit too much water in there. And then someone in Q&A asks, is it best to use a wet palette doing this versus a dry? 
Um, that's a great, and I don't think it really matters. I don't use a wet palette for, um, you know, the only reason that I use a wet palette is because it helps keep my paint from drying out faster. But because we're working with stippling and we're not worried about having a super thin mix here, you should be fine with a dry palette. Too. It should be all right. Yeah, you could the white stipple. I'll show you here. So that's what it looks like. If it'll ever focus. So very really rough. And because we're thinning the paint and stippling it, you're naturally gonna have some areas that are thinner and you're gonna have some that are thicker and that's good. That's what we want. And the, in a heavy hand, yeah, that's okay. That's fine, yeah. Um, and you know, maybe a heavy hand will turn out to have some interesting textures later once we blend everything together. So remember that for later. And if you like the way it looks, just remember, yeah, it's better to go a little bit heavier on things. Uh, someone asked if you're using the white to map out the brightest part of the nebula. That's at the, yeah, that's it's exactly what we're doing is we're gonna, because of the way that the clears work, when you put them over a brighter color, you can see the, the bright layer that you added first, but the clears will sort of add a filter of color over top of them. So what we're doing is adding the structure of the nebula. And I'm gonna add a little bit more just to the middle parts um, where the, the, hi the highlights will be brightest, which you can do if you'd like. So yeah, great question. That's absolutely correct. Oh, and I'm also adding just a little bit to the bottom right and the top left, just to keep interest throughout the model, right? So that it's not just one stripe and then an empty space at the top bottom. So just a little bit, but mostly I'm focusing on that line that we planned out there in the beginning. Then someone asked if they're supposed to not stipple white in the shadows of the cloak. Um, it will, it should fix itself. It doesn't really matter because later we're gonna be adding a bit of shadow to those recesses. If you get white in the shat in the shat, ugh, if you get white in the shadow parts, it doesn't really make a difference. So don't worry too about being too neat. Um, like you can see on mine here, I have a few areas that I did get some white down in there. It's all totally fine. The thing about this technique really is that it's not like we have steps lined out of what we're doing, but a lot of it is sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It kind of has a mind of its own. And it, it's a great thing for everybody to try because you don't have to be so controlled with it other than knowing the steps to do for it. And, you know, I mean, that's nice because they'll all turn out a little bit different and that's kind of uh, yeah, it's organic. There you go. Thanks, Dean. <laughs> Nature is random. Very true. Makes a some... better stippling brush. Hair synthetic. I've always used synthetic only because I haven't want I haven't wanted to cut any of my natural hair brushes. Um, so that's something that you could try and uh, see which one you like better. Cool. Yeah, let me know. Okay, so let's move on here. The the white should dry relatively because we're not adding a lot of it. So the next thing we're gonna do is go back to the colors again, the clears. So we're gonna be a little bit more controlled in where we're putting the colors when we're covering up the white and blending it. So I'm gonna show you the original one again. Now, if you look at the left here, you can see that I have magenta sort of, sort of lining the bottom of that nebula right there. And then along the top here, which is a little harder to see, but there's blue lining the top. And that's what we're gonna do today for this one is we're gonna try to do that pattern, which is we're gonna, we're gonna blend them all over, but we're gonna try to keep magenta toward the bottom of those clouds. And then the blue, we're gonna keep at the top. And the purple is gonna be the blender that sort of brings everything together. So the first thing I'm gonna do is with my stippling brush, I'm gonna take some of that magenta, just like we did in the beginning. I'm gonna remove some of it, 
with the towel. And then along the bottom of the nebula, I'm just going to stipple and make sure that you're covering some of the white as well as some of the sky. So extend the magenta down a little bit farther into the sky. Do a little focus here. You see there, and it's gonna, it, when it dries, it'll be a little bit less uh, obvious. So don't worry if you think that you're the aren't, because when it dries, it'll be a little more subtle. There is no backward. <laughs> Okay, and then once you have the magenta on, you don't need to, oh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot the two little, the two little ones around the, the bottom there. I'm gonna do the same thing. Magenta at the bottom. That was a lot there, but that's okay. See, even if you think you add a little bit too much, that's fine. We'll blend some stuff later. So, so magenta along the bottoms. And then let's go rinse the brush off a little bit and take some of the blue. Same thing, take some of that paint off and then we'll go across the top of the stars. And again, you wanna cover some of the white and you wanna cover some of the nightmare black that you laid down the base coat. Once you have those on, you should be able to see it's starting to form the, the illusion of depth um, because I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I believe that the reason that nebula clouds look the way that they look is because light is refracting through a, like a prism effect. And that's why when you see photos of them, they usually have you know one color at the bottom and one color at the top. And you should start to see that illusion a little bit in there. And it kind of makes some depth. It kind of gives the illusion of depth, which is what we're going for. So once you have the blue and the purple laid out, or I'm sorry, the blue and the magenta laid out, you can take some of the purple and just sort of blend it in with both colors. Um, keep, keep a little bit of the white through the middle don't cover all of it up, but you can use the purple to blend out the other two colors. So stipple it just a little bit on top of the blue. Don't worry if the blue's still wet and you're picking some of it up. That's totally fine. Same with the magenta. You can just stipple a little bit on. You don't have to worry about being super neat. And yeah, there we go. So it's going to look kind of weird still, and that's totally fine. Seen the meds. What was the teacher's name? Mrs. Frizzle. Okay, so you have the rough layout there. Now, this part, you can spend as long as you'd like going back and forth between the white and the clears. When I did Sophie originally, I probably spent maybe two hours just like adjusting. If I felt something needed to be a little brighter, I'd go back in with some of the white and just hit that little space just a little bit like I'm doing right now. And it's like, oh, I want this, this part to be a little bit brighter. So I add white. Okay. And then... If I'm like, oh, it's a little bit too bright, the edges are a little bit too harsh, then I just grab more of the clears and blend well, the edges out. Yeah, go ahead. Someone hopped into Q&A and asked, are the Reaper clears roughly equivalent to the inks of other companies? They don't have any Reaper paints yet. Okay, so the clears are not the same. I was, Reaper does make inks. But I, uh, the inks and the shades and things are more like washes. Those are, th they're thin and designed to flow into uh, like the recesses of, recesses of a model and create like the illusion of shadows. Um, whereas the clears are more, uh, 
the, they're not gel, but I feel like gel is like a, like a good way to describe them. Like, you know, like stage lights, whenever you're like watching a play or if, you, if you've ever been part of like a play's crew, you have stage lights and you put filter gels over the light and it'll color the light that's kind of like what I consider the clears to be. Um, yeah. Transparent. There, there's, there are a lot of names for them. I, I can confirm that they are closer to single pigment colors. Yes. Yeah, single pig, exactly. Single pigment colors. Right. Okay. So let's work a little bit more back and forth. What time is it? One thirty. Okay. we got to move a little bit quicker here because I want to get to the, the messy fun part, but so you could work at this, as much as you want, just keep going the white, just in the middle, creating the highlight part of the nebula. And then once you have that mapped out, just go ahead back in with the clears and blend it out. And like, like I said, you can do this for as long as you'd like until you're happy with the way that it looks. And there is another opportunity to do this later. So if you move on and you're like, and you get, you know, down the line a little bit more with this and you realize, ah, I should have done this a little bit more too late. You still have the uh, option to do that. So once you have your colors laid out and blended in like that, we're going to do some fun and messy stuff here. So in the class notes, I recommended something to cover a surface. I ha I'm, I don't have anything other than this um, self-healing mat, so that's fine. But if you don't have, I would move any other projects out of your line of fire because you don't want a galaxy over things where there aren't supposed to be a galaxy. Um, so uh, if you have painted the rest of your mall already, that was another thing I wanted to touch on. I was talking to somebody before the class a little bit about this. Um, it's a good idea to mask off the areas that you don't want to have a galaxy. So like, let's say you painted the rest of the model and you have the staff and the hat and the frog and everything. You just take some blue tack and stick some blue tack over top of those areas. Um, and they should be fine. I don't, I've never had blue tack pull paint off of a model, but I'm sure it's possible. So if you know another way of masking, I mean, aside from like masking tape, uh, you know, if you know another way of masking an area, then uh, yeah, that, that'll work too. But you just don't want to, you want to make sure you don't get stars all over uh, your non-star areas. Do you know that um, mask it stuff that uh, like watercolor artists use that you can paint it and it's like a liquid latex and you can pull it off? Do you know if that would work too? I'm not sure. I've never used that before. I'll have to pick some of that up and try it out though because it sounds interesting. I think Liquitex makes some. Nice. Okay, so let's do the next part here. So what we're going to do is there's things, there's two ways to do this. And I usually use both of them, both of them today. I think we probably have time. We have about, we have about 20 minutes left. Let's just go for it. All right. So we want to load the brush with white like we did before and take a little bit off there so that there's still some in the bristles. And then take your brush about, I'd say three inches from your model. Is that three inches? Sure. Two and a half, three inches. And then take your thumb and just pull back across the bristles and flick. You're a little blurry. Oh, sorry. Let me see if I can do it. Yeah, that's a little bit better. So pull back and just flick. And what it'll do is atomize some of the paint. A nice variation of little dots. And the reason that I like that is because it's really, really tedious to try to put every single one of the dots down. Um, not to mention that even with like the finest bristled brush, I don't think that I could ever get a dot that small over and over again like that. Um, so if you've moved on to that part, 
some of the dots, some of the stars that you added might seem really bright. So what we're going to want to do is vary the tones of those stars. A toothbrush, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm sure that it would work. I'm sure that it would, but a toothbrush is big. So I have the feeling that if you, you'd have to practice it on something else before you did it on a mini, because for me, I feel like if I used the whole toothbrush and did it, there would just be way too many stars and they might be too big. Uh, yeah, D Danielle, thanks. It tends to be messier. That sounds right to me. Dragon wings would be cool. Um, but yeah, well, the good thing though is, is if once you cut a brush or once you get a stippling brush, you never have to worry about it again. You have something specific for it. And also try it with, with blood or try it with red paint. And, you know, you could get some blood spatter on things. Um, try different, try it di for, for different things and show me what you've done. You know, that's the cool thing iteration and experimentation you know i like i said that's my favorite part of this hobby so okay so now that we have those stars on there i'm going to show you the second way to do it just really quick and it's very similar to the first but you just take some white on your brush like before and then you take a second brush and don't it's not going to get messed up or anything and just hold it across and just just tap it together. And you're going to get a similar effect, but the clusters of stars that you get from that are going to be a little closer together. So what that does is it helps to create some depth um, to make it look like some of them are farther away. Yeah, method A is more controlled for sure. But I think I wanted to mention the second part because you do get a little bit of a different effect from both. And when you put them together like that, I think that uh, it's worth at least trying both of them for yourself to see if you like them. So once they're on there, we're gonna do some glazing and this is really, really simple. So don't worry too much about it. What I'm gonna do is take a little bit of the clears. So like I'll take, so we'll start with the blue. I'm gonna take some of the blue and I'm gonna thin it down some more paint bottle strength of the flicking or still a little water still a bit of water yeah you want it to be a little bit runny um it's going to be a trial and error thing because i'm pretty sure that the the more water you have in the paint when you start to flick it on there the bigger the beads are going to be when it, um flow improver surfactant i'm not sure because the idea really is that you don't want it to flow. I, I mean, you might be right. Believe me, I, I, I haven't tried it, so you might be right. But I, you, when you do the stars, you don't really want them to flow. You want them to stick and dry. Um, uh, what, which brush did you just change to? Oh, just any, just any sort of, the, I'm using the one that I used to base coat the model uh, from the beginning. So any, any sort of brush. And you want to thin the, uh, the clear, a clear down so that it's, really really thin almost almost water we don't really want to add we don't want to do anything except for color some of those stars that we laid down yeah you do want it to flow off your brush easily that's that's very true so what i'm going to do now is just go over top some of those stars and just add some color to them and because the paint's super thin, when that dries, you won't really be able to see it over the sky. It'll only be over the white that you just laid down. And you can do that with any of the other colors too. And magenta, so take some, take some magenta, add a little bit of water to it. Very thin. And then just go over some bars. And that's just, again, making some depth the illusion of depth so that some of them seem like they're farther away and some of them seem like they're closer. So once you have that done, I mentioned earlier, you'll have <laughs> a little overzealous. Yeah, that's okay. It happens. Might even end up looking like amazing later. You never know. Uh, but once you have the stars done there, you can go back to the nebula 
and reinforce those colors again. I mentioned, you know, you'll have the opportunity to go back and make those whites whiter and make the, the colors on the edges blend a little bit more. And this would be the opportunity for that. So you could go back to your stippling brush and back to the original clears and come in and let's say like, I wanna make this section a little bit more blue. Add some right there and put some up there. Yeah, yeah. You, and like I said earlier too, you can work at it as, as long as you like, as long or as little as you like. But yeah, it's looking good, Chris. Yeah, it's it's really crazy because the dry paint and the wet paint, you know, the one little difference makes things look a lot different. So, so that's what we've got so far. And that's pretty good for uh, less than an hour. And you could go back and forth, like I said. And the last thing I'm going to do, actually two things, is if you'd like to add a few bigger stars, you can just take some of the white. I'm just my base brush again from earlier, my base coat brush. And I'm just going to take a little, a little bit of paint and I'm going to add just a few maybe bigger stars, not too big, but like, I'll put one right there. There was somebody that asked in Discord how you did the mm -hmm. first flicking technique. So I think once we're done with this, maybe we can do a little repeat yeah, of that. It. Yep, sure. So I just add a little, a few little bigger, a few bigger stars, like there's one down there and you go back through and blend it again. If you want, I'm not going to do that for this, but Okay, and then I'll show you how to add, add a shoot thing that sort of, in my opinion, adds that final little amazing touch. So again, to just take some white on a brush. Doesn't have to be anything special. <clears throat> when I paint, I usually paint in glazes. So I find myself removing, you know, I, I don't want my brush to be too oversaturated with paint. So what I'm gonna do is start out I'll put my comet right down here. So I'm gonna start out with just a little circle. Let's do one right there. And a little circle there. And then I'm gonna figure, I'm gonna have it coming in this way. So what I wanna do is start behind the comet and just pull paint toward the ball that I drew getting thinner the farther away it is. And you can skip the recess. Yeah, blurry, I'm sorry, Lauren. Um, ball, oh, it's still blurry, huh? There we go. So there's like a little ball there and then I started to pull lines into it. And if you have, a, um, if you feel like you've made it a little bit too big, that's fine, we can take the clears and shade out the edges to make it look like it's a little a little bit farther away so there's the there's a rough one right there and then I'll take like some of that blue thinned out clear paint that I had earlier and just uh on this the sides in the back just cover it up just a little bit thicker the farther away that it gets and that'll give it a little bit of an illusion like it's coming closer as well as traveling down to the right. I even like circle it a little bit too. And you can do that with any color. You don't have to use, also do multiple. Like I still have some of that magenta clear glaze. So I'll add some of that just to give it some interest. Someone asked in Q&A uh, why the paint might appear to come off during the paint process. It is well washed, he said. Um, the which, which layer? Is it the base coat layer or the clears that you're adding? If it's the base coat layer, I, I couldn't rightly say. But if it's the clear layer, it just might be because they're still wet. 
and that's okay. He said uh, the clears with additional water. Yeah, it's probably just because they're not dry all the way yet. Um, And when you're doing this, like on your doing this, like later um, in between steps, you could wait a little bit longer and let the paint dry completely before you move on to the next thing. The real, the real, the time where you want to um, wet blend a little bit is when you're blending the nebula together. Um, but other than that, you and step away from it and come back to it later. And that might save you from pulling up that stuff that you put down earlier. Um, okay, so we've got about eight minutes left. I just want to finish off really quickly by, I, so I mentioned, somebody mentioned earlier about layering your cloak first, um, which, you could try to do that. But something that I did each time was I went back to the base coat color and I made a little bit of a glaze out of that too. So I took some of that aside just with my base brush and I added a little bit more water to get it really thin. So, so thin that you can see through it on the palette. Like again, if you're using a dry palette, it'll be a little bit different, but you want it to be almost water. Very, very thin like that. And then what I did is I, took some of it on my brush, got the excess, went in to the recesses and just darkened them down a little bit with the nightmare black. And that'll have a double effect of making the folds of the cloak a little bit darker, but also it'll tint anything that's in there. So like if you have stars that are in the folds of the cloak, it'll darken them down a little bit and make them look a little bit farther away, which is also a cool effect too. Someone asked in Q&A what colors work well with the galaxy effect. Um, I've used purples, blues. Um, I would say try, something I wanted to try but I didn't try yet is an orange and green one. Um, when I was looking for reference photos, I found some really, really cool looking orange and green nebulas and I have the the there is well it's not available now unfortunately but there is a clear orange um from I think it was from last year's ReaperCon but there is a clear yes. red and a clear yellow so you could always mix them together and make your own clear orange um and there's a clear green too so I think that those two together would look really cool um maybe with the clear yellow is sort of like the um the blending color in between them I would love to see what other people do um, so if you ever decide to do one with different colors, please share it, you know, tag me in it. Let me see it. Someone in chat just posted that they did orange and green. Oh, awesome. We make sure you share it uh, on my discord page. Um, I really would like to see that. So that's pretty much it. What we're left with in the end. Um, and I'd say for under an hour, it looks pretty good. Uh, you, the, obviously the longer you work at, at it and blend it and, you know, go back and forth, it's going to look better in the end. Um, but yeah, that's the basic technique uh, is just, you know, sky color, add the nebula, put the stars on, blend everything together, shade it up, and then you're good to go. And another thing too, is I don't know if you are, if you guys seal your models when you're done, but I've found that different paints have different um, like finishes. So some of them are more glossy than others. So that creates kind of a, a different effect too that you don't really notice while you're painting. But later in your model, when you come back to it, you'll notice that it pulls things together. Uh, so definitely try that and take a look at it. Um, last thing before everybody leaves, I'm going to be doing a little bit of a giveaway here. You don't have to be... Um, it's not like a popularity thing. It's not a, a competition on skill or anything like that. All I want to do is see the models that you painted from the class. So I go into my artist alley chat, post your pictures of the model that you painted today. I'm just going to put everyone into a drawing and draw tomorrow. Uh, and you have a second chance to win. If you go to my Polk's workshop, Facebook page, I'm going to make a post about it. Just comment your photo on that post. It'll be a second drawing, so you have two chances to win. I'll be sending some Reaper stuff out. Um, yeah, so make sure you do that. And thank you all so much. This was incredible. I hope that you all had a good time, and I hope that it was beneficial to everybody. Um, come chat. I'll be around in my Artist Sally chat for the rest of the day today. And uh, 
yeah, everybody have a great day. Someone in Q&A just said that they recently upgraded their streaming rig and would love to send you one of their extra webcams for future needs if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think that I need something better than my phone. So, but thanks for bearing with me. I appreciate it. And then before we end, uh, I did have an idea if you decide to teach this class at a future ReaperCon or ReaperCon. Okay. Um, maybe there's a poll option on Zoom and maybe mm. for the first like five minutes of the class, opening up the poll and having them pick the three like colors yeah, that you use. Yeah, that's a great I idea. I think that would be really good. Yeah, that would and... be really good. Awesome. Well, thank you again, everybody. And, and chat someone... with me. What's up? Someone said that was a phone question mark. Yeah, it's my phone. <laughs>